Hey, hey everyone. All right. Welcome to Live at Five. Every Wednesday we do a live broadcast. I'm Jessica from Clayshare and this week is a huge one. This is basically almost a full semester of Glaze 101. That's basically what we're going to do. Well, we're not going to get into the application. I'll talk to you about applying Glaze, but uh, mostly it's going to be you and the thing about glazes is if you get, you're just getting started in pottery, glazing can be really overwhelming and there's so many glazes out there. I mean, you can see what I have before me on this table is just a small sampling of one, two, three, four, five, six different companies glazes plus glazes I make myself in the studio. So there are a ton of people out there making glazes commercially that you can buy and you can also make your own glazes if you want to. So this, um, this was something I was going to do for clay share as a class. I might turn it into a longer class if you want me to, but for right now, we're just going to do this, this little live. And what I want is I want you to bring me your questions so that I can answer them for you and tell you a bit about glaze. And I'm going to show you some glaze combos that I've used in the past that are really successful that I love and also some new tests and talk a bit about different glazes and everything. So, if you don't have it yet, get yourself a notebook and a pen. You're going to need it because you're going to want to take notes because I'm going to give you lots and lots of info and you're going to want to write this down because you're going to not be able to keep up if you don't. No, I'm kidding. You can always go back and watch the replay. That's the beautiful thing about video. So if you don't write it down, you can just go back and watch it again. So hey, hey, everybody tuning in. Hi, everybody over there on YouTube, everybody on Facebook. Instagram is not working because there's a poor connection to Instagram. Sorry, Instagram folks, I'll keep trying. Um, we're also live on clayshare.com and on vimeo.com. So streaming at five locations right now. So here's the thing. Glaze is basically a thin layer of glass with some alumina in it. And you apply that glaze when it's a liquid. So it's glass you apply as a liquid. You put it on a basically stone, right? Stoneware or porcelain, a pottery surface. And then you fire it in a kiln, heats up until it turns molten and then solidifies as it cools. So you're taking something that's a liquid, melting it until it becomes a solid. So it's a really cool chemical change and Glass is basically made up of three parts. So the best glazes for red clay, we'll talk about that, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you all an intro and I'm gonna tell you what they're, what, a little bit about glazes and then we'll talk specifics about different clay bodies, texture, crystalline glazes, layering for creating depth and effects and all that. So let me just give you the beginnings so that you have that information and you can go forward and wreak all kinds of havoc on the glaze world because you'll know too much, right? You never know too much. And if you are a bibliophile like I am and you want more great glaze books, check out my Amazon shop. That is amazon.com slash shop slash clayshare. And under my books suggestions, I have a bunch of great glaze books and you can find out more about glazing. So um, a glaze basically has three parts. It doesn't matter who makes the glaze. It is a glass former, that's your silica. And silica is flint and quartz, they're all the same thing. Sometimes it's called silica, sometimes people call it flint, sometimes they call it quartz when you see it written out. And the next part you'll have is a stiffener, and that's alumina. And what that does is it makes the glaze more vis viscous so that the glaze is thick and kind of sticky. And that's what keeps it from running off too much. And then the last part is a flux. And that's usually made up of feldspars and that helps the glaze melt. And depending on what you use for a flux, that'll determine the temperature your glaze is gonna go to. So some fluxes melt at a lower temperature, some at a higher temperature. So that's why we have these low fire glazes and high fire glaze categories because it's the different fluxes and other ingredients in there. So that's just kind of the basics about what a glaze is because people don't really know what is in a glaze. Now, if you go to Europe, they call glaze glass. Makes sense, right? It's the glass. And that's basically that layer you're seeing right here. It's like a layer of glass. So if you're gonna buy glazes, there's a bunch of commercial glazes available and you can buy them either in paint-on version 
in little jars. I should have grabbed them. Or dip and pour versions that you usually mix up with, you add your own water. Yeah, grab me a bucket of clay scapes and a, a bottle of brush on glaze and I'll show you the two. So your choices are make your own glaze or buy them commercially. That's it. There's no other way to get a glaze. You can either make it or you can buy it. So Clayscape sells glazes in dry form. You just add water and they are dip and pourable. They also sell them in brush on versions too. Now this is a bucket uh, about a gallon and a half a glaze and this is for dipping and pouring. This right here is a brush on glaze. A lot of times you'll find your brush on glazes are thicker and that's because they've had some things added to them so they are thicker and you'll apply two to three coats of a brush on glaze where this bucket here, you're going to dip it once, maybe twice if you want a second layer, but you don't put so many coats on when you're doing dipping glazes versus brush on glazes. So that's a little, there's a little, this is, this is all like my lecture when I used to teach ceramics. When you, when you take glazing with me for a semester, you get to sit there for 45 minutes and take crazy notes because it was an intense class. All right. So once you realize whether you're going to buy your glaze or whether you're going to make your glazes, you have to think about the qualities of your glaze. And the glazes basically can be divided up into four categories of surface qualities. You have matte glazes, satin glazes, gloss glazes, and then crystalline glazes. Now, there are some others we're not going to get into, but those are the main ones that most people are going to be using and dealing with. The pottery store in Canada that sells clayscapes glaze. Jane, if anybody can help Jane, um, I can't remember which glaze do I like the best. I, I don't have one favorite. If I could only ever have one glaze ever, I would probably, would be a cheating answer. I would say clear because you can put any color under glaze <laughs> first and then put a clear on top, right? So that's not really an answer, but you could do that. Um, and so when you get your, your glaze, It'll also either be translucent or transparent. It'll be semi-transparent or opaque. So those are more glaze qualities. And matte glazes are pretty much always an opaque glaze. Satin glazes can come in a, they are clear and then, well, transparent and translucent, although they tend to go more opaque. And it's just the qualities of the mattifier that's in the glazes to make them less glossy that causes them to be less opaque. So those are some properties of the glazes. So thinking it sounded like a lecture. It's not a lecture like you've been bad. It's a lecture like here's a bunch of really great information you need. And after I got just like one more little kind of lecture -y thing and then we're going to look at the glazes and talk about them. And so I'll show you examples of these glazes. So um, your glaze, how it looks when it's done will completely vary depending on a few things. So it'll depend on the clay you're using. It'll depend on how thick you applied that glaze and it will depend on how you fired it and what temperature you fired it to. So those variables are why I can have a glaze that's the same glaze look a certain way and you can use that exact same glaze and it'll look completely different because it's so individual and there's a lot of variables. So let's get started and let's just start simply and we'll talk about glazes. Now I showed a little video this morning with some Amico brush on combos and everybody wanted to know about those. So I'll talk about those first and then we'll move into some others. So um, when, you, when you go to buy glazes, sometimes they're broken up into categories such as celadons or chinos or um, sometimes they'll have it their stoneware line. And those are just ways that companies can categorize their glazes. Although traditionally a celadon glaze was a specific glaze and Shino glazes came from a specific region in Japan. And the same thing with Temaku glazes and um, all kinds of other glazes out there. So nowadays when we buy glazes, they'll say celadon and that pretty much means a translucent glaze. Something you're gonna be able to see texture through. So this right here is one made by Amico, and this is called Wasabi, and I think we'll switch to the overhead because I can zoom it all in. Hold on. Ooh. And then I can show you the glazes as we talk about it, and we can talk about the different properties. 
So when you have a piece to glaze, you have a lot of decisions to make. You have to decide what are you going to put on it for a glaze, and that can make or break your piece. Sometimes when we glaze pieces, we can actually destroy what we were making. Not, you know, not intentionally, but we have a vision in mind, and sometimes you put a glaze on and it doesn't match that vision, right? So this right here is wasabi. That's this on a test tile. So you can see this beautiful glaze. It does really nicely on texture. So if you're using textured pieces, you really want to think about using a glaze that's going to work for your texture. So that would be glazes that are considered celadon, trans translucent, transparent. You can use opaque glazes, but you want to test and you usually have to go thinner to get a good result. Now, this one I love, it's a great combo, the wasabi, and then on top here is lustrous jade, two coats. So three coats of the wasabi on the entire outside, and then the lustrous jade, three coats on the rim, and that gives this beautiful effect. And on the inside whoop, is Amico Sky Blue. So this is an Amico Glaze Combo Mug right here. And that's what you get. And it shows off my little mushroom pattern beautifully, and it's just really cute. And I like pairing a glaze that's translucent and we can see the texture with a glaze that's a little more opaque and will hide it a bit. That creates an interesting contrast and just makes the mug have um, more character, right? It gives it a little something. So you fired a matte glaze and it's too flat. Can you put a clear gloss on refire? Yeah, you can, yes. So let's go to matte glazes. I have a matte, a couple matte glaze examples. Matte glazes are what we would call a dry finish. When you rub them, you'll, can you, I don't know if you can hear, I'll rub it. Let me put it by my mic. Do you hear the scratchy? They're very dry, they're very rough. They feel a lot like naked clay Except, except sometimes they're even drier. So like the back of this is smoother than the front where the glaze is. So here is a mug topper glazed with a cacao mat. It's the Chino line from Amico. And then around the edge is oatmeal. And look at how dry the whole thing is. It's very dry. Now, you might not want to use this on a dinner plate because if you go to eat food off of this dry surface, your spoon or fork or your knife will make this horrible sound. It'll be scratchy and it, it won't feel good. And it's a little more difficult to clean. You'll have to really scrub if any food dries on that. So if you're doing food wear, you want to consider that. Oftentimes, matte glazes are only used on sculptural pieces or non-functional pieces. And here's a planter I did, the same combo, that cacao matte and then on top the um, oatmeal. And that's what I got for a finish on this planter. And I did the inside and the outside. So if you want to play with matte glazes, you can always put them on the outside of things, mugs and bowls and such, and do a clear glaze on the inside. How many coats of clear would I put on? That would entirely depend what clear I'm using, Rachel. So if I was using a clear that I made in my studio, a dippable one, I would do one coat. If I was using a commercial brush-on, usually two coats. Just depends. So this is a matte, and then we move from mattes to a satin, and some glazes fired at cone five, like this matcha gloss from Amico. This is also a Chino. In my kiln to cone five, it's a beautiful, yummy satin. Some people will fire this to cone six in their kilns and they get a glossy. So that can really affect how the glaze changes and how the finish looks. If you go even lower in temp, you might get a drier, so less satiny finish. But that's often a sign of a glaze that's underfired and you need to refire it. So that's satin. Satins are beautiful and they have a really nice feel to them and they're good for food wear, they're good for sculpture, they're basically the, the happy medium. But oftentimes satin glazes are not the best for texture because they tend to fill it in more than a glossy. So this is a beautiful satin glaze. And now we're gonna move over to a glossy. So staying in similar color tones and again with Amico. This is Amico Ironstone, three coats, and then on top, I grabbing my notebook. 
and you've heard me say this before, keep a glaze test notebook because what will happen is when you're glazing, you'll think, ah, I'll remember that, I'll know what that is, and then it comes out of the kiln and you can't remember. So I'm gonna find out, when did I do this one? This one's a little further back. Small bowl, iron stone, and then toasted sage on the rim. If I didn't have this notebook, I would have forgotten and I wouldn't know. What temp is my cone five? Well, John, I fire till the cone bends. It goes to 2167 is usually the temperature I get, but I do have a 40 degree cone offset, so it's actually 2127 is what my kiln will register. But when I pull out my cone pack, cone five is completely bent and cone six is just starting to bend. So um, I don't know if Kev will grab one, the white one there. So this is a cone from a firing on September 8th, 2019. And I keep these for reference and this was on the top of the kiln. And you can see when I make my cone packs, you put your lowest melting cone in the back, the, the cone, your target cone in the middle, and then your guard cone in the front. So you have guide, target, and then you have guard cone. So cone four melted, a lot. Cone five is completely down. That's good. Cone six is just starting to bend. So I know I got a nice even cone five. If my cone six was bending over a little more, it would have been a hot cone five. So that's getting close to the edges of where cone five becomes cone six. And there's not a rule where cone five is 2167 degrees Fahrenheit and cone six is 2168. That's not how it works. It's just, it, it slowly creeps up and then it, sh it switches over. And time and heat work um, does affect. So does the toasted sage have a flux on it? No, this, well, we don't, if you heard my description about what's in a glaze, all glazes have flux in it, but this is just ironstone three coats, toasted sage three coats. That is it on this sweet little bowl. So that's what you'll get. And ooh, look what I did on the inside. How nice is that? And this is on Laguna B mix. And if you use a different clay, it could look different. So let's talk about something on two different clays and what the effects can be. So here we have a mug that's hand built and this is on Laguna B mix, a nice creamy white glaze. I mean, creamy white clay with no grog, nice and smooth. This is my cobblestone glaze that Clayscapes is now selling. And this is my spearmint, which they, they already carry, on top. So these were dipped, but you'll notice how we can see the texture. But when I over dip with the spearmint, we lose most of the texture. That's okay. That's the effect I was going for. Now, let me grab a different, let me see where I've got one. There we go. So there it is, the B mix. What if I put it on Laguna 90? That's this clay here on this little dish. So this is how it looks on the 90. It doesn't break quite as bright white as it was here. See how white it is on texture and how bright it is? You still see the texture, but it's darker. It has a depth to it. So the glaze is a little different. And just because I want to spice it up some more, I have got a, is this my speckled? Nope, that's 92. I don't have a speckled version of this out here right now. If I find one, I'll share a picture. But when you put on speckled clay, it will look different again. That's just how it is. So it does change. So you accidentally put four coats of a brush on glaze, turned out satiny instead of glossy. Can you overglaze it? Um, if you put too much glaze, what tends to happen is you get crawling, which is where your glaze peels away or tries to pull away from the clay. My, my thought is that it didn't get hot enough. Laurie, so maybe you didn't get up to temp. And Deborah, you just unloaded your kiln full of Mako glazes. We are gonna talk about some Mako glazes. So this glaze right here is just, this cobblestone is just a semi-transparent gray glaze. And you can see your texture through it, but if you put it on a piece without texture, it still will look beautiful. So that's a, a good choice and it's a good example of different clays. Now, I do have, this is on B-Mix, do I have it? There it is. So here's on a speckled clay. This is my spearmint 
on Laguna B-Mix. And you can see this glaze is a more opaque glaze. You still can see some texture, but it, it tends to fill it in, and that's just the way this glaze is. This would not be my first choice if I was doing a highly textured piece. I would go with something that was more transparent. But when you put it on a speckled clay, look at how beautiful these specks are. See them popping out? All those little flecks that you're seeing, those are actually in the clay body right here, and they come through in the glaze. And it's just beautiful. Um, here is my Lake Blue, which is my other new glaze that just came out on a speckled clay, and you can still see the speckles there. And then here's that same blue on the 90. So there's the 90, there's the, this is the 60 over here, this is the 90 over here. And when you look at the pieces, here it is glazed, and here it is there. So you can see the difference that you get. And I actually have the, hold on, and then here is the Lake Blue on B-Mix. Look how bright it is. Look at the difference. You put it on B-Mix and it really brightens it up. Put it on a speckled clay. I wouldn't say it dulls it down, but it just changes it. It makes more of a denim -y color. Uh, shivering in a glaze where it pops off, that's because your clay and glaze are not shrinking at the same rate. It's poor glaze fit. So I would say it's your clay body is causing that to happen. That's actually where the clay and glaze shrink at different rates and it will cause it to actually come off in flakes. It's a, actually one of the more dangerous glaze faults because you can cut yourself on those little bits of glaze. Yeah, Carmen, these were, this was, these were brown clay pieces. I don't know if I'm behind on comments, but you have this right here is a brown clay this over here. So here's cobblestone uh, again on a brown clay. This is Laguna 90 and you can see what it looks like. You lose the brightness. You see the difference? Do you see you still see your texture but the B-Mix lets the light color of the clay show through. Now I want to show you a couple other things. We've got a ton of comments and I love it. So keep bringing all it in. Do I typically brush on my glaze? No. <laughs> I don't typically do anything. I will do a combination. I do dip and pour and I do brush. It just depends on the glaze and who makes it and how it's best applied. And sometimes I will do a spray on glaze too, so I'll spray it on. So let me just show you a couple different clear glaze options. So this is EM Satin. This is my clear 2167. You can get the recipes to make both of these on clayshare.com under resources. So the piece itself is the same clay, it's Laguna B-Mix. The under glazes are the same from Speedball. And the glaze is just a satin clear. So do you see how this beautiful satiny finish and a gloss. So you can see the difference between the two. Both are gorgeous, it just depends. Do you want that high gloss shine over here or do you want a more satiny finish? Angie is asking if the Laguna 60 is a good clay for bakeware. It sure is. The 60 and the 90 are my go-to for bakeware. They handle thermal shock really, really well. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the way a clay can affect how your glaze looks. So here I have my Chun. It's my Chun Blue. And this is on porcelain. Look how beautiful it is on porcelain. It's like a true robin's egg blue. And this is a good glaze for texture. It is a semi-transparent glaze. It's not um, like a celadon. It will show your texture, but it, it's, a, it's a fatter glaze. How's that for um, a definition? And then here's the same exact glaze on Laguna 80. So this is a red clay that has no grog in it. It's just a smooth red clay. So it's the red version of B-Mix, basically, but it's not red B-Mix. It's, it's similar. And look at the tonal difference. Look how much cooler in tone it is over here on the flask than it is on the candy dish, on the little pierced bowl. It changes it completely. And then here, to throw another piece in the mix, this is the inside of it on B-Mix. So if we look at the rim right here, this is my Chun Blue, thinly applied on the rim. Here's the same glaze applied to this bowl, and it's the same glaze that's on this flask. So your clay it completely determines how a glaze is going to look. 
Uh, so John wants to know, is my 2167 zinc free? It sure is. And you will know it is because go to clayshare.com under resources and you can actually print out the recipe and you'll see there's no zinc, zero zinc in my glaze. Now, thanks Kev. And Clayscapes Pottery has a crystal clear that is zinc free. Georgie's Ceramic makes a zinc free clear. Amico's um, Mixing Clear is zinc free. So there's a lot of zinc free options. All right, we're getting, we're getting closer to the mugs. So plates are great things. Um, yeah, Christina, there is a thing called Red Bee Mix. Uh-huh, it exists. It's out there. So this is a plate I did. And one thing about plates that's really fun is you can play with glaze on the inside and not really worry about the dripping too much because it won't drip off. Now you might have some glaze issues where it's a little too thick, but overall, you don't have the issues where it's dripping down a vertical surface. And I'm gonna show you a mug glazed with the same exact glazes. So this is Sky Celadon from Amico first, then three coats of Emerald Falls, also from Amico, and then Blue Lagoon. So that's what I have here. This mug, same exact glazes. But when you put it on a vertical surface, we have more fluxing, we have more melting. Do you see this here? Do you see how we're dripping more? We have more interaction, more movement going on because as the glazes heat up in the kiln, you know, they'll start to run and as one layer runs into the next layer and into the next layer, they'll kind of grab each other and start pulling them down the piece. And that's what creates almost this little waterfall, they call it, pattern. And you'll see that here. And it's beautiful, but you'll notice I didn't go all the way to the bottom with my multiple layers because I didn't want it to run. So that's why my foot is bare so I don't have clay that runs to it. So that's kind of a cool thing, right? So the combo here is three coats of Sky Celadon from Amico on the entire thing, three coats of Emerald Falls, about, I would say, two thirds the way down the mug, all the way around, and then Blue Lagoon, a band about one third of the way down the top. And so that's what I did to apply that. And for the Blue Lagoon, I used a smaller brush, one of my Sumi brushes, that's a S-U-M-I, or you could use a number eight round brush, and that would work really well because you wanna paint it on kind of wiggly and in layers. So that's, that's an example of what happens when you have a flat surface versus a vertical surface to glaze on. And they turned out really well. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. So what else do we have? Oh, we got so much more to go through. Okay, let's keep going. Woo! So let's talk about um, one of my favorite glazes to use for texture, which is Shadow Blue from Clayscapes Pottery. It's, they have a whole line of celadons. They have a really nice purple. They have a fog gray. They have a um, amber, which I love. It's super yummy. And it looks amazing on texture. Here's a little lace bowl I made um, using GR Pottery Forms. Actually, my class, the la I think it's Lace Bowl class, Kev. Is that the name of it? In, in my Lace Bowl class, um, this is the, the bowl we make. So I put shadow blue on the entire thing, and then on this side, ooh, it's a little dusty, I dipped this. So I dipped it one dip this way, and then I dipped it in shadow blue here on this side, and then I also dipped it with a, um, my, it's actually my Oribe, but Tim's Dark Celadon would work and give you a similar effect if you're buying glazes from Clayscapes. They sell that. But it's like a, it's similar to Amico's Rainforest. Lace Lace possible, exactly. Yes, the Blue Lagoon on that previous mug does overlap the Emerald Falls. Yes, it does. Yeah, they all overlap each other. So it's uh, in layers building up. You love Shadow Blue with Tim's Dark Celadon, Susan. Right, and my Oribe is, is uh, similar in effect, and this is what you'll get if you use my Oribe with it, which will be coming out later this year from Clayscapes. So we'll, we'll have that glaze too, so you can create this exact combo. And I have some others. Now, here's shadow blue on a no texture, beautifully thrown bowl, but on the rim, I've over dipped with Clayscape's cream, and I'm trying to get it, there you go. Look at this right here. So over dipping with the cream, and you'll get that waterfall, you'll get that melty happening right there, and it's so yummy and so beautiful. Keep that in focus on that. 
So it's a little, little view from it. And then the view from the inside, and you get this right here. Nice melty happening. I have a few more with shadow blue and cream I didn't grab because they're all basically versions of the same thing. And let me show you cream. So that cream glaze that's on this rim right here, this cream glaze, which is an opaque glaze, um, you can put it on texture. It will show texture. It, it hides it a little bit, so you just keep that in mind. Here it is on a little bowl that is the speckled Laguna 60 clay. So we have that beautiful speckling. You can tell the clay by the foot. And here it is, nothing but that beautiful cream. That's the only glaze on here. Honestly, you don't need another glaze. It's, it's perfect all its own. My favorite plate in the house is a hexagon plate I made with the GR Pottery Forms that has just a simple crisscross pattern and this cream glaze. It's my favorite one. I love it. I use it every day. It's like my go-to plate. I was thinking about it the other day, how much I loved it. Clayscapes cream's like bacon. It goes with everything. Have I tried cream with spearmint? Yes, I have. It looks great. Um, hey, Kev, you want to grab uh, bottles on the window right there by you? I'm going to have Kev grab some pieces. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have all of those, but I have tried cream, and it looks good on all of them. So let's start with my cobblestone and cream on top. And I did a light application because I didn't know how the cream would react with my cobblestone, but it looks pretty good. And you can see cobblestone here, cream here. And this was on porcelain. This is Laguna 16 porcelain on this bottle right here. It's fully glazed top to bottom with my cobblestone and then dipped to about here with cream. So that turned out really nice. Um, this is interesting on the porcelain again. It's my lake blue on the entire thing. Look how bright the lake blue is on porcelain. Look at that. You put it on porcelain and it changes everything because here it is on B-Mix. And B look how light both these are, but you get a totally different effect when you put it on porcelain. And then I put cream on, again, a thin, thin layer. Look at what that did. That's kind of cool. Now you could go thicker and you'd get more of this melting and waterfall effect to that. And then I don't have, uh, that's the blue on there. I don't have uh, the spearmint with cream. I did do it on that shaker. Kev, you grab that shaker over there by the box right there. You got it. He got it. So this was me going way too thick. Oh, wait. Here it is. This is the cream on the spearmint right here. So you'll get this. It goes a blue. It's crazy, I know, but it changes it. So this is what the cream looks like on spearmint. But again, this is on porcelain, so it looked different on B-Mix. And Leanne's here. Rudazil. Leanne, it's her birthday. Happy birthday, Leanne. Hope you're having an awesome day. I'm glad you made it in. So I have any, none of the glazes I've shown so far have had flux added to them. They're only... It's only the glaze, as I've mentioned. Nothing with flux yet, but we're going to get to that. We're going to get to flux. So are all these dippable? These are all dippable, yes, that I have. They do have, Clayscapes does make brushable glazes, but not all of them are available. That, let's see. Not all the glazes they make that are dippable are available and brushable. Sky Celadon from Amico on black underglaze decals. So if you're looking for a glaze that has some color to it to go on top of underglaze decals, check out the Celadons. Both Amico and Clayscapes has some great Celadons that'll work fabulously for that. So this is just that sky blue. That's it on there. And we can still see those snowflakes, but it's not as bright as they would be if we did just a clear. The cobblestone is dip, right? It's dip. And it's um, more towards the semi, less of the translucent. It's, it's really a traditional stoneware glaze. Now, let's look at some other things. Here we go. Amico chai gloss with textured amber on the rim on a plate. Same glaze combo on a mug. 
You notice the Amoco glazes don't move that much. They pretty much stay sedentary. So the look you get on a plate for these particular glazes, these, these two here, um, you're going to get a similar look on a mug. So we don't have a lot of melting or running, although that textured amber completely obscured our texture on the top, but you still see the little mushrooms on the rest with the chai gloss. How many layers can you do before it's too thick? Well, you got to watch out. If you go too thick with the layers, it could start to craze and peel away. This was three coats, and I'm grabbing this one because this is the one with the most layers that I have right here. Three coats of the sky blue celadon, three coats of the emerald falls, and then three coats of that blue lagoon. And it, it, this is about where I'd be done. I wouldn't put more, and I never would do the entire mug top to bottom because that would just, it would melt. Now, when you layer this many glazes, they do start to flux more and melt more. So just, just keep that in mind. The more glazes you put on a piece, the more it is going to melt. Can you put a wash over decals or a matte glaze? You can, um, but a wash, if you try to wipe back, will smear off, most, mostly will smear it off. So you could do a light wash of a glaze, if that's what you mean, where you just brush on a really light layer. And as far as a matte glaze, you certainly could just be aware that matte glazes tend to be opaque, so they'll, they might hide your texture. Now you could do a satin. You could certainly do a satin like this. If, see how glossy this is, how shiny? See how this is not quite as shiny? So this is that EM satin. So you could try that and you'd get a less glossy surface. All right, let's look at a couple more. We got. I got tons of mugs to go through. We'll be. This is Amico Aqua Celadon. This is one of my favorite Celadons. I think I like it so much because look, look at my chun next to it. They are so close. I think that's why I like it because it's similar to that. So this is three coats of Amico's Aqua Celadon, still showing our beautiful texture, and then Lustrous Jade, also from Amico on the rim. And then look how yummy that is down on the inside right there. What would go with pitch black on a flat surface, John? Um, I love my chun. Cream looks great. Oh my gosh, if you haven't tried cream on pitch black, you should. My chun um, looks great on pitch black. And um, what else? Drew, chime in if you got some suggestions. So here it is on a mug. Here it is on a plate. Not much difference. There's not a lot happening, not a lot of movement. The Celadon glazes are really stable. They like to stay put. So I know that when I use these, I'm getting similar results. We got a question? Yeah, from uh, Vimeo. Okay. Uh, with uh, Celadon on texture, is it two coats? Mm. It depends on the Celadon. This Amico Celadon is three coats, and you can still see the texture easily. but. Some celadons, if you put on three coats, it'll be too much. I, I have some examples. Now, Georgie's doesn't call these celadons. This is their tie-dye line of glazes. This is their neon orange. Two coats works great with the Georgie's neon orange. You'll still see your texture. If you put three coats on, you start to lose your texture. It gets way too thick. And I found that with all of their tie-dye glazes. Here's their purple haze. You still see the texture, it's more subtle. Their sea foam, again, two coats, and their pistachio, two coats. So always do tests before you do a big piece. That's why you see these little tiny tiles floating around. These are all Amico Celadons. Here's some more Amico Celadons. Now the poppy Celadon gets a little thick, tends to hide it if you go too heavily. So that is definitely a no more than three layers. Storm Celadon, again, will show your texture, but it won't show it as much as something like the Aqua, right? So the Aqua really allows our texture to pop. Well, the Storm, you see it, but it hides it a little bit. When you glaze over underglaze decals, the glaze doesn't stick everywhere. It looks like pits. Um, I'm not sure, when are you putting your decals on? If you're putting them on bisque ware, um, I'm thinking that maybe you need to do another layer of glaze. We should talk about that. So here is Tangelo, applied two coats. 
And here's Poppy applied, again, two coats. If I went heavier, I would lose my texture. Okay, you guys want more of the mug combos I was showing, don't you? So I'm gonna have to, where did I put all those? I did this one, I did this one, I did this one. Oh, I think I got, did I get them all? Did I get them all? I think I got them all. So let's show some differences when you use a, a glaze that is fabulous on a mug and you try it on texture and you might not love it on bisque. So I'm thinking there might be some, the underglaze itself that's transferring. You need to have the glaze be a little thicker. So go ahead and make sure you put another coat of glaze if it's a brush on. If it's a dip on, then maybe when you dip it, hold it for a tiny bit longer. Make sure it fills in because if you don't have enough glaze on there, that can cause that issue. Now, as long as you're not getting pinholing in all your glazes, that's a whole different thing. So we're gonna switch and talk about some Mako glazes. I absolutely adore Mako glazes. I mean, I, I love everybody's glaze, right? So this one right here is Raspberry Mist on the entire, well, on the bottom two thirds of the mug, Raspberry Mist. Blue Hydrangea on the top two thirds of the mug and then Mako Light Flux on the rim here. And that's three coats of everything. And I love this combo so much, I wanted to try the Raspberry Mist on a texture because I love this pink. So I put it on, uh, your favorite mug, a mushroom, roll, a mushroom mug that I did. So this is Raspberry Mist with Light Flux, no, Dark Flux, this is the Dark Flux. And you can see it's definitely a more opaque glaze. I haven't lost my texture completely, but it's certainly not popping out like it does here. So it's the same mug design, same mushrooms over here on the pink one, but you don't see them as well. They're there, they're subtle, but I think with the raspberry mist, you don't want three coats, two coats for texture, and just keep in mind it might fill it in in some places. So that's uh, really good to know. So after I did the mug, I decided to do a plate with two coats of raspberry mist to see what happens because this was three coats. Here's the plate with two coats of raspberry mist. Now, I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but you can certainly see the texture much more with the two coats on the plate than you can with three coats on the mug. So that's just a little, a little something I noticed. And this was a good test to check it out, but um, you know, the mug's still great, but it didn't, it didn't turn out exactly like I wanted it to. And we have, oh, here's another one, and I can talk about this too. Um, sometimes when you wanna highlight texture, you um, wanna use a underglaze to help you out. So here I applied a black underglaze first to the texture and then wiped back. And that's a way that you can still use a glaze that might not pop as much as you want on texture and really highlight that texture on there. So this fern has that black underglaze wiped back. And then this is shadow blue from Clayscapes, which looks lovely on texture by itself, but you really see this fern. Like this fern is there, you know it's there. And then I over dipped it in my Oribe, which is the rim. And when my Oribe touches the shadow blue, you'll notice it goes almost to this beautiful kind of purple violet hue right here. I don't know if that's picking it up, but it goes like the green to a turquoise to um, that kind of violet. It's gorgeous. It's a really nice thing. And then here is shadow blue. So the same thing, black underglaze on the entire mug and then wiped back. So you could see the, the black had filled in the recessed areas, dipped it in shadow blue, and then quickly dipped it in my Oribe. And this is what you get for the finished result. And again, you can try Tim's Dark Celadon if you, don't, if you can't get my Oribe, which you can't because it's not out yet. <laughs> so wipe back underglaze on bisque wear right before glaze, yes. So you do the black underglaze on the bisque wear. You, I'll post a video tomorrow showing how I apply underglaze and wipe it back before glazing but I always do it on bisqueware, and that's what this little, this little cup is, was bisqueware when I did that, and that's what helps highlight that. Now, I could have used a different color. I could have used a dark, dark blue under glaze, and that still would have popped a bit, a little more subtle than the black, but you still could have done that, right? 
So you just got some Mako and you don't know what colors. Do I like Mako more than Amico? No, um, I like them both equally. I know that's not a fair answer. I don't have one glaze company that I like more. Well, Clay Skates Pottery because of course they make and sell my own glazes and I love them. But um, honestly, they're all great glazes. It depends what you're looking for, for an effect. Now, I really like Mako glazes for the crystalline aspect. So they have these beautiful crystal blooms in their glazes and that's what you're seeing here and that's what you're seeing on this mug and on this mug right here and I haven't found Amico to have any of these um, in their glazes at this temperature these are five cone five cone six so for the inside of my glazes for my mugs the like this sweater mug that's my chun blue I often will use my chun blue as a liner because it's just a nice light blue, a simple glossy food safe glaze. It goes with just about everything. Although I will use my cobblestone as a liner and here it is on this piece. Again, that's a food safe glaze. So it's just a nice one. Um, here is another, and when we talk about liner glazes, what are we talking about? We're talking about a glaze that you use on the inside of a mug or a bowl to line it. And that's usually just a inexpensive glaze a simple color, something that's food safe and that you like and will match what's going on the outside. So inside is my cobblestone as that gray and then outside is Mako Coral Sands and then Desert Dusk and Light Flux. So that's what you're seeing here. Oh no, this is their, their um, sandstone, sorry. Coral Sands with sandstone on top and then Light Flux. And the difference between sandstone and desert dusk, sandstone's a little glossier and has black little specks, and the desert dusk is a little more matte and it's more um, like tans and, and creams and nude colors. And the yellow is Mako, yes. This is frosted lemon from Mako. That's this yellow you're seeing here. And on the inside, I glazed the bottom two thirds and then I did blue hydrangeas, top two thirds, and then light flux on the rim. You can see what that gives you. So that's this combo. And I think we actually glazed this on Clay Share Con. Did we glaze this one? We glazed the pink one. It's basically glazed the same as the pink. I just use yellow on the bottom instead of the pink. You can buy crystals separately and add them to your glaze. I haven't noticed. I didn't know that, Susan. Oh, that's a world changer. Um, we didn't really talk about crystalline glazes as far as making your own, but that's a whole other line of glazes. They are runnier. They usually have excess zinc in them to have those silica zinc crystals form. That's zinc oxide. And it's very low in alumina, so that means it's not as viscous. It's not as thick. It's not um, as sticky. It runs more. And so that's a whole other category of glazes, which, you know, some people specialize in that because they are a specialty glaze, if you're going to make your own. Now, Mako has these great crystals that um, are already in their glazes. So this is a Mako combo. This is just one glaze. This is called Night Moth. And it's black with these beautiful green, brown to blue crystal inclusions, gray colors. And I have three coats of the Night Moth on this little shaker. So cute. This is the class that's gonna be out Friday. This will be Friday's class. Here's another shaker. Shake, 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 shake your shaker. So we'll, we're gonna make this on the wheel. Could you hand build one of these? Cause I know someone's gonna ask. You could, I was thinking about figuring it out for y'all cause it's such a fun wheel thrown project. I think everybody's gonna wanna hand build. Did I talk about everything? Holy moly. All right, so I think, I think I talked about everything. We, we can switch back. Was anybody else have any other questions? I mean, So different looking with two glaze colors right initially and it all changes you know the when you put another glaze on top of a base glaze it completely changes how it looks and how it reacts so I, I mentioned pinholing sure so pinholing happens for a couple reasons mostly people are not bisking their clay hot enough and what happens is when you bisque fire clay it changes it chemically and it off gases and those gases those organic compounds have to burn out and be released as a gas. So that's what's happening. 
So when you bisque them, what you're doing is you're burning most of those away. You're not burning all of them away, but most of them. So you need to go to a hot enough temperature where you're burning off those organic compounds. It's off-gassing, but not so hot that your clay vitrifies or seals. Because when your clay seals, then it's no longer porous and it won't take your glaze. So you have to find that happy medium. If you find you're getting a lot of pinholing, my suggestion is to try bisking one cone hotter. So if you're bisking now to 06, you might want to try going to 05. If you're bisking to 05, you might want to try going to 04 and see if that helps. The other end of that is when you go to glaze the piece. So what I do is at the end of every glaze firing, I do a 10 minute hold. And what that does is it takes the kiln to the top temperature and then it holds it at that top temperature. So 2167, the kiln is there, it stops and it stays at that 2167 temperature for 10 minutes. And while that's happening is the gases are coming out, those compounds have finished burning off. And then when that kiln shuts off, everything starts to solidify. And if those gases haven't burned off, they get trapped like little bubbles and that's pinholing. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure you're bisking hot enough and you wanna make sure if you're still having problems, you do a hold at the end of your glaze firing. It'll also give your glazes a chance to melt a little bit more and run a little bit more. So keep that in mind because they could melt and run more than you expect. So just, just keep that in mind when you're doing it. So that's um, a little bit about pinholing. It's, it's something I don't have an issue with at all in my clay. I use Laguna B-Mix. I also use Laguna I'm going to name them all. Ready? Write down all the clays I use. My stoneware. Laguna B-Mix 5 with no grog. Laguna 60, which is a speckled tan clay. Laguna 80, which is a brown smooth clay with no grog. Laguna 90, which is a red-brown clay that has sand and grog in it, so it's a little gritty. And I also use Laguna number 16, which is their porcelain. Now, as far as earthenware, I use their EM100 for white earthenware, which is a beautiful, smooth, white, creamy clay. That's actually the clay on this piece right here. And I also use their terracotta, their earthenware. So that's all the clays. That's it. That's the only ones. Oh, and I use Georgie's um, dark chocolate trail mix clay, which is this beautiful chocolate. I don't have a glazed piece right now. I will in my next kiln opening have some pieces to show you on that. So hopefully that helps. Um, the satin glaze I showed, the EM Satin Clear, yes, it is. This one is just the clear satin glaze. That's EM Satin Clear. Yeah, that's that one. And do you have to clear coat over an underglaze? It depends on the underglaze. So Mako makes these underglazes called Stroke and Coat, which I've not used, but they're an underglaze that basically has glaze built in. So you don't have to. But if you look at Amico underglazes and Speedball underglazes, if you don't clear coat, they're gonna be dry. They're gonna be the same texture as your clay. Um, let's see if I have a, this will give you a good example. This mug right here is underglaze, Speedball black underglaze, and no glaze on top. It's kind of like a chalkboard. It's the same texture and feel that the clay has. You can put it on your clay, as long as your clay is vitrified. It's still food safe, um, but Ideally, if it's on the inside, you do want to glaze it with at least a clear. You, want, you do want it to, to be sealed just for it to last longer, and it'll just be a nicer thing and easier to clean. What's the brown glaze on the mushroom mug? Yes, this is Amico Shino. This is their chai gloss. That's what's here. That's the glaze. And then on top is their textured amber. That's the top here and the rim here. So it's the Amico Shino, and I fire this to cone five. It comes out more satiny, and you can see this one's a little glossier here, so this was at a hotter, a little bit hotter spot than my plate, just a little. All right, so we can, can pinholing happen when you don't let your glaze dry enough between coats? So Debbie, what you're seeing is if you have areas that have little holes uh, from your glaze, Sometimes if your glaze is too thick when you're applying it, it won't fill in the texture well enough. And I've seen that happen on not this sweater mug here, but other sweater mugs because there's so much texture. And what I found is if I thin my glaze down just a little bit more and then apply it, it gets rid of that. So what's happening is the glaze is really thick and it's not getting down in those recessed areas enough. 
So thin it down just a hair and see if that helps. It could be pinholing, but it could also just be the glaze being too thick and not filling in. So that, that can happen. So let's see, textured amber, textured amber brown. It, I know, so it is, hold on, let me grab the bottle. I'm gonna grab the bottle. It's textured amber, not amber brown. <laughs> it's this one. It's this one right here. It's textured amber, not textured amber brown. Textured amber. I know, and I've used both. Both are gorgeous. I actually, where's the piece I did the texture amber? Oh, that planter over there. Um, I got a planter with textured amber, cosmic tea dust, and smoky merlot. Hey, assistant, you want to grab that planter? It's that round one that's glazed on the bottom. Keep going past the box, straight to the, straight ahead. It's brown, all browns. Yeah, you got it. It's like a, he wins a prize. It's like a carnival game. Can you find the glaze? This, this is textured amber brown on the entire thing, three coats, even on the bottom, because I fired it on stilts. Oh, it's so nice. It's very nice. And on the inside, too. And then I took Smoky Merlot. You can see the purpley here. Blobbed on two coats. And then Cosmic Tea Dust, I did the same thing. Blobbed on some around the rim and various places. So. Did I hand build the bunny mug? I did, yes. Right, so this is a hand built mug from a slab. And when it was still a flat slab, before it became a mug, I rolled my bunny rolling pin, that's my spring bunny rolling pin, into the clay slab. And then I rolled it up, added the bottom. See, it's got a bottom. And then put some volume in it, you know, stretched it out a bit from the inside, pulled a handle, stuck it on there and then you get a mug. And I believe it's very similar to my sweater mug shape. It's a little different, but I do have a sweater mug class and they're very similar. The difference being the sweater mug texture is from a mat, from a silicone fondant mat. This is from a rolling pin. I love this. This is like my favorite thing right now. This right here, this set. It's like perfection, right? You checked with Mako. So um, all the Mako glazes I have shown, they're food safe. Yes, yeah, so anybody asking about, are these food safe glazes? Yes, ma'am, yes sir, they are. Ooh, this matches me. This one kind of does too. Ha <laughs> ha, who knew, right? <laughs> all right, so let's see. Textured amber with the cosmic tea dust and the smoky Merlot. I know, so this planter, It'll hang. I'm just going to wrap a cord around the rim because I have this beautiful deep indent and it will just hang. It'll like hang back here. It'll just be a beautiful hanging planter with a little succulent in it. And it'll probably hang in a window over there because there's no sun coming through this one because I got a curtain in it. But um, all right. How many layers of flux do I usually use, Charlotte? Um, usually I will apply, let me find one with, woof, there it is, two coats, flux. If you buy the Mako Flux product, so it's a glaze that just melts a lot. And they have a light and they have a dark. This is the dark. The light um, is more of a white. Two coats and it runs. Do you see? Do you see these drips? It runs. So, all right, let's see if I can catch up. Something on that table has matcha, matcha gloss on it. Uh, right here. This has matcha. She knows matcha gloss. Gorgeous glaze. I love the way it feels. Um, I need to make a mug with this. I want a textury mug with this matcha gloss. I did do one. I sold it. I didn't keep it. It's my Southwest mug. Somebody out there watching has it. It's a gorgeous mug. I hope you love it. It was my woodland mug because I used the matcha gloss with the textured amber, not textured amber brown, just textured amber. Can you use a glaze over flux? You can, Sally. Yes and you'll get a different effect. If you put the glaze over the flux, the flux will be a little less pronounced. It'll still be there, but the, the change between the two won't be quite as much. So give it a try. Do one piece with the flux under the glaze, do one piece with the flux over the glaze, and see how you like it. And that's why I always make these little bowls. They're such great glaze tests. They're easy to make, and you know you glaze it, and it's not that big of a deal. 
a mug has a handle and all the parts. Bowls are usually better for glaze tests. The palladium is not food safe. No, and I never use the palladium, that's Amico's palladium, on the inside of anything or on the rims. I usually put it on the outside if I'm going to use it, but I don't, I actually don't use that glaze. I've seen it, it's gorgeous, but I, I don't, I don't use it. So let's see, what is the glaze inside the Night Moth mug? That is my cobblestone. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? It's a really nice gray. And basically the cobblestone is the perfect liner glaze. I've used it on this kind of like creamy, corally mug. I've used it here on this one. I used it on the pink mug. It's like a great liner if you're looking for something that's not like this is your liner. If you don't want something light, you want it darker. Okay, so let's see if we can catch up. Um, are all the glazes friendly to each other? I have discovered most companies' glazes do like each other. Most of them play nice, but just like with everything, you should always test. All right, that's all there is to know about glazes. There's nothing else. Now you know everything. <laughs> I unleash you onto the world. Go glaze your pots, fire them, and I can't wait to see them. I bet they're going to be amazing. Now, I will continue with the glaze Q&A sessions. You know, um, it, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's very overwhelming when you first start. Uh, I learned in a university setting and we were basically given a glaze recipe and my professor was like, go make this and we mixed it up and we had to use it and either it worked or it didn't work and it was kind of trial by fire. I would never suggest that to any of you all. Um, but what I like to do and the reason I do this and give you this information is so that you can learn from my mistakes. You can see examples that I've done that you might like and you could give that a try. So if you're starting out, you know, safe glazes, celadons are great for texture. Um, you know, you have the chino glazes, those are beautiful too. There are so many other, like the stoneware line from Mako and their little crystal bloom line, these little crystal glazes, I love. Um, so many options. Um, a couple of things I just want to mention quickly before I go, in application. Matte glazes, so this is your order of application, matte, satin, gloss. Put your mats on first, if you're gonna layer, you put your mat on first, you can put a satin or a gloss on top of a mat. You can put your satin on first and then put a gloss on top, right? And then gloss, can you put a mat or a satin on? You can, but you don't usually get your best results. Now we can put a gloss on a gloss, a mat on a mat, and a satin on a mat, and a satin on a mat, <laughs> a satin on a satin, that's not a problem. Not at all. But if you're gonna layer different glazes with different properties, Matte, think about this, matte first, satin, gloss. Matte, satin, gloss, in that order. So if I, right here, matte glaze, put this one on first, and then put a satin on top, and then a gloss on, if you wanted to layer. I'm not saying put those three on a piece, it's just, that's a little um, save you heartache down the line, because if you put a really dry matte on a gloss, they, they might, um, not like each other. And they can run into some issues with glaze fit. So that's just a little something. All right, hopefully that helped you all. Uh, you know, there'll be more questions, of course, and I'm, well, I'm happy to answer them, so please ask. And I'll come back and do another one of these, and we'll talk more about glazing as we go forward. Remember, there was a new class on Monday. It was this no trim vase. Now, I didn't, I talked about how I carved the design, but we made the vase in the class. I think I'm gonna do this as a class, the design itself, I'll show you. It's uh, scraffito carving, it's also stamping and drawing. So it's a little bit of, a little bit of everything. And we could, we could do that as a class. All right, everyone, be safe, be well, and I will catch you next week at 5 p.m. Eastern for another live broadcast. I probably will pop in Friday around lunchtime just to say hey and see how everybody's doing. Now, those of you who are premium members of ClayShare.com, there's going to be a private broadcast coming on. You can watch that on ClayShare.com, or if you're in the private group on Facebook, you can watch it there too. All right, everyone, have a wonderful night, and I'll catch you all next week. Bye, everybody.